So I don't know about you, but sometimes when I uh, go out with you know, my wife, Sherry, and, and our family, sometimes I feel like we're just doing stuff for the pictures. You know, we just choose to go here, or we do this, just so we can have pictures, and everybody wants to take uh, pictures all the time now. We have selfies, you know, we're taking selfies all the time. I was at the ball game with uh, Sherry and my, my daughter Zoe the, this last week, and in the middle, I'm having a great time. We're watching the ball game, and, and uh, uh, the, the Royals lost, and I mentioned last night that I'm not sure if the Royals would ever win again, and so maybe you ought to say a little prayer for them. They won yesterday. And so I don't want to say that that was an Easter miracle, but maybe it is. I don't know. And, uh, and so we were watching the ball game, and Sherry said, we have to get some pictures. And, and so she wanted to take a selfie uh, of us sitting in our, our seats there. And, and so uh, she's discovered uh, now this, uh, you know, the rear-facing camera is a better camera, evidently. And so you can take a selfie with the rear-facing camera. But you, you have to know, you know, you set it up and you have to get it and know what, it's all sort of magic to me. It's it kind of witchcraft. I, maybe that's too strong, but, you know, I'm not sure how you do that. And so she, Sherry's trying to take the selfie and, and she can't get it right because you can't see yourself on the screen if you're using the rear-facing camera, and so she's trying to do this, and finally she said, Zoe, you take this, and so Zoe took the selfie, and it was just perfect, because evidently if you're born after a certain year, you just, this is innate to you, you know, you're one with the cell phone, and so you can do this without seeing yourself on the screen, you take this picture, and, and I thought, you know, back in the day, it was really an event to get your picture taken, uh, think about, you know, in 1826, I think it was, when the first permanent photograph was, was taken, it took eight hours for, of exposure time for that, that picture to happen. And so, of course, you weren't snapping selfies of yourself, you weren't taking pictures of people, because nobody was sitting still for eight hours to take that, that picture. But soon, that exposure time was reduced to 15 minutes, and then soon after that, even less than that. And so, people became fascinated with taking pictures. But still, uh, back in the day, you had to sit very still for sort of long periods of time and, and, and in order for the picture to come out, for it not to be blurry. Have you ever seen really old portraits of people? I mean, they look miserable, don't they? And, and I think maybe part of that is this experience. They have to sit still and the photo, uh, photographer's saying, don't move or it won't come out. You know, you, you'll be blurry in the picture. You have to sit absolutely still. And so evidently that, you know, precludes people from smiling or whatever, and, and so yeah, they just looked miserable. I don't go back quite to 1826, but even when I was a kid, getting your family picture taken or getting pictures of the kids taken was sort of an event. You got dressed up, mom said, hey, this is the outfit you're going to wear, maybe you had brothers, and they, okay, everybody has the matching shirt, and so you were embarrassed before you left the house, and you, you go to the Sears, and you go to the back of the Sears, and, and you climb on these boxes covered in carpet, and the guy's pulling down screens behind you, this is no green screen, he's pulling down these giant map screens you know, do you want to be in the forest or in the mountains or how about by the fireplace? And so it was this event to get your picture taken and now we're just snapping selfies all the time everywhere we go. And I have a confession to make. I'm the world's worst selfie taker. I don't know if it's the short arms or the stubby fingers, but I can't, I can't hold the phone just right. And in fact, I've given up. I've got some really old selfies that I've taken. And what happens is, is that somebody's always cut off in the picture. Sometimes me and their poor Sherry, you know, just nostrils staring at you. Nobody, nobody wants to see that. And here the last one is, you know, Clayton when he was just a, a young guy and, and uh, he has a black eye. It's not because I was so frustrated with the selfie taking. But I think that was a wrestling injury, and so uh, something always went, goes wrong when I try to take the selfie, and I'm missing some important part of somebody. You know, I, want, I just want to include the family. I want, I want my whole face, no matter how detrimental to the picture it really is, in the picture. I just want to be whole. And really, that's, that's sort of what life is for us, isn't it? I mean, we've all been searching and trying and, and looking for what makes us whole. When people ask really big questions, you know, things like, what's the meaning of life? What are they really asking? They're asking, why do I feel like something's missing? What do I need to sort of complete the picture here? You know, they might say, what do I need to really be happy? What do I need to be content? What do I need to be 
whole. So I'm not cut off. So I'm not excluded. So I'm not, I, I'm just completely in the picture. How do I get to be whole? There's really a simple answer to that really big question. That the only way to be whole in life, not only in this life, but for all of eternity, is to know Jesus. Easter makes us whole. I think the story of Easter in John chapter 20, the first 18 verses, teaches us three parts that we need to be aware of in order to be made whole by Easter. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to the Gospel of John. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in your New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 20. I'm going to take a look, and we're going to take a look at the first 18 verses here. In John chapter 20, just the story of, of Easter, in John chapter 20, Three parts that make us whole. John chapter 20, this is what God's word says. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Uh, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed." For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid them. Having said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him uh, to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Our amazing story, uh, the amazing story of Easter teaches us three parts that, that can make us whole this Easter. Part number one is that God has this one perfect plan. He's got one perfect plan. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in verse 1, and while it was still dark and saw that the stone had had been taken away from the tomb, so she ran. We get a little time stamp here, don't we? We we catch up with the story. Uh, It's on, on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, very early, while it was still dark. We, we know that this last week, from Sunday to Sunday, has just been a tumultuous week for Jesus' followers, for his friends. You know, Mary was probably there when Jesus rode in on that, that Sunday before, on Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, and people laid their coats and palm branches on the ground and shouted, Hosanna! She was there as people cheered him in victory and welcomed him as king into Jerusalem. She was there when Jesus marched into the temple and and chased out the money lenders and, and created this huge spectacle. She was there, perhaps, when Jesus ate that last supper with his friends and Judas was ID'd as the betrayer and Peter was predicted to deny him three times. We know scripture tells us that she was present at the cross as he cried out, it is finished. And now she's at the tomb, in the dark, wondering what to do next. 
I think it's so interesting that, that Mary is, is, is singled out here. The, the other gospel accounts tell us that Mary didn't go alone, that she, she went with a group of other women, and so there were uh, uh, several folks there, a couple other folks there with her, and, and here John focuses in on Mary, and, and I think it's just to, to sort of indicate to us that, that God has this really big plan, and, and he makes a way for individuals to be a part of it. Uh, people that sometimes you make a lot of sense, and sometimes of people who, who you wouldn't necessarily think that this creator, sustainer, redeemer God, this big, big God who creates the universe would, would include in his plan. Because here's Mary, this, this, this lady who was possessed by seven demons that maybe doesn't fit in the story all that well. But here she is on that first Easter Sunday at the tomb when it was empty. And God's always had this plan. He's always made a way and, and used folks in that plan and, and been a part of their lives and, and built a relationship with them. Since, since creation, he creates this garden. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden. And he said, okay, Adam and Eve, you're in charge. You know, take care of things. You run things. And, and by the way, I've provided everything you need. So, so enjoy this garden. Eat whatever you want, except for the fruit from this one tree. And what happens next? We know that Adam and Eve, they give in. They buy the lie of the enemy when he says, God doesn't really mean it. This fruit is really good for you. You ought to try it. And so Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Sin enters the world. And God's creation, his perfect creation is broken. And in the midst of that brokenness, even as God is literally cursing Adam and Eve, he offers the first symbol of hope. He says, I'm going to send a hero. I'm going to send a savior. I'm going to send a Messiah. And even though the enemy will strike his heel, there'll be Friday, my hero, Jesus, Messiah, will crush the enemy's head. Sunday's coming. And even in the midst of this, this first sin, this curse being pronounced on Adam and Eve, on mankind, on humans, God offers this hope. Hey, and right away, Eve and Adam, they, they start looking for this Savior. And they, they have a couple sons, and they think maybe these sons will be, you know, that's how God's going to provide, and then not so much, that doesn't work. And you get to a, another son, Seth, and they say, oh, maybe this is, is, this is the hero that God is sending. It's interesting, you just turn a, a page in the book of Genesis from that, that fall, that first sin, and, and God, you know, offering that glimpse of hope. You, you get to Seth, and, and the Scripture says that it's, during this time, the time of Seth, the, the, for the first time that people began to call on the name of the Lord. That's such an interesting phrase in Hebrew because it, it carries with it this idea of that, that's when people started to, to call on the name to remember God. To remember the hope that he promised. To look for the answer to this problem. To how are we restored to wholeness. How do we get back to where it was before we broke it? And it doesn't happen right away, does it? We, we get from Seth, we get to this Noah and the flood and this destruction and, and from Noah to, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Jacob has these 12 sons and, and these brothers, they, they throw one of them into a pit and they sell them into slavery and they, they end up in Egypt, all 12 of these sons and this entire family. Uh, desperate in need of this this brother's help that they've sold into slavery and and eventually kind of long story short this this family grows into a nation that's enslaved in Egypt and we get from Abraham Isaac and Jacob to Moses who God uses to lead his people out of captivity in Egypt and Joshua who leads them then into the promised land and then judges to rule over this nation of people and the people said we want a king and so God gives them Saul and then King David and the glory days of Israel under King David. But they slip away so quickly with his son Solomon. And you get from Solomon to the, the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel who are either living through or prophesying about God's judgment on his nation and how they'll be ruled by these, these foreign powers. And that's the way it is for God's people. When you turn the page to the New Testament 
And after hundreds of years of silence, John the Baptist comes on the scene. And he's preparing the way for Messiah, for the hero. Mary and Joseph and then Jesus and Jesus with his 12 disciples and, and, and outside of that group of his closest friends, the 12, you get people like Mary Magdalene and this group of women who are at the tomb on that Easter Sunday. You, know, you think about God's big plan and how he's included all of these folks in that plan and used them in, in powerful ways to make it all happen. And, and here we, we come to the, the sort of fruition, the, the end of the story on Easter Sunday. And here's what we sometimes miss. You are no different. You are no different than, than, than Noah or, or, or Jacob or Moses. You are no different than Mary or Joseph. You are a part of God's big, perfect plan. He, he wants so much for you to know him. Mary is a part of that plan. And, and in the moment, in, in, in verses 1 and 2, she just can't see it. All she sees is the darkness and the emptiness of the tomb. And so she runs I don't think she runs in celebration. The tomb is empty. It's Easter. She runs in, in dread, in fear, in confusion. And she searches for, for Peter and, and, and John, the other disciple, is how John refers to himself. She's looking for somebody to make sense of that. She needs that hero. You know, when I was a kid, I, I watched, I, I would say I read books, but not so much. I, I watched these shows, you know, movies and, and shows, and, and uh, they had heroes in them. And sometimes the heroes were like, you know, this person, and you like, oh, man, I want to be like that hero. And other times in these shows or movies, the hero was just a car. There was this one show that I watched when I was a kid, it was called Knight Rider. And uh, this guy, it's a story about this, this policeman who, who goes through this, you know, he gets shot and then this rich guy rescues him and, and does plastic surgery on him and says, hey, you're going to be a hero. You're going to make a difference in people's lives. And I'm going to equip you to make a difference in people's lives by giving you this car. Well, it wasn't an ordinary car. It was like, had this computerized car. It was called Kit. And you, you knew Kit was thinking when the red lights were flashing on the front of the, the grill. And, and in the first episode, this guy who's renamed Michael Knight, the hero, is in this car, and he's driving down the road, and the car starts talking to him, and he freaks out because cars didn't used to talk to you. You know, I understand he's upset that the car is talking to him, and I understand because sometimes I'm driving down this road, the road, and this lady is, starts shouting at me, turn left, turn left. I'm like, I don't want to turn left. I want to go the way I want to go. And, and so now we're all sort of night Rider, right? We're, we're struggling in relationship with our cars. And this is Michael Knight, he, he, he doesn't want to have a relationship with this car, but over the course of the series, he builds this relationship with the car. Now, I get that this is a reach, all right? Understand, I, I get it. But there's this big, big God who has created everything you see. And to me, it's really amazing. It's so unexpected that he would want to have a relationship with a guy like me but he does. He wants you to know him. And he has this big plan that he's orchestrated since before creation that ends up here in, in John chapter 20, verses 1 to 2, with Mary running to Peter and John. And even though she doesn't know it's the answer, it's the answer. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I do not know where they have laid him. She says, the tomb is empty. And she makes up the, kind of this first conspiracy theory, right? They did it. They did it. She's looking for any possible explanation. And she doesn't quite know it, but she's got the answer. The, the difference that, that happens on this Easter, the difference between Jesus and any other martyr, the difference between Jesus and any other religious leader, the, the difference between Jesus and any other philosopher is that he rose from the dead. 
Some author way smarter than me said it like this. He said the major difference between the life and teaching of Jesus and those of any other great religious leader lies in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and others did not. However persistent their influence may be, however often they are studied, however admired they are, the difference is Jesus rose from the dead. That tomb was empty. It's God's perfect plan. Part two is that we have this, just like Peter and John had, we're going to discover, we share in this one perfectly imperfect faith. Take a look at verse three. Here it says, so Peter went out and the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Peter came. There's this race. I, I love this scene. It's one of my favorite accounts of the Easter story, because Mary runs, and she finds Peter and John. They've been hiding. She said, you've got to check this out. The tomb is empty. Somebody stole the body, and so Peter takes off. I assume Peter left first because Peter does everything first, right? He gets out of the boat first, he speaks up first, and he takes off running. And we find out that in this race, Peter loses. You know, I was at the ball game, in every major league ballpark, they have something like this, the, the hot dog race, you know what I'm talking about, the ketchup, mustard, and relish, who wins, and, and why relish ever wins, I don't understand. But, you know, they have this hot dog race. In Atlanta, they have something a little different. They have this guy named Mr. Freeze, and it's this Olympic quality athlete, caliber athlete, who dresses up in this blue jumpsuit, and they bring challengers from the crowd to run this race. And Mr. Freeze allows these challengers, he gives them a huge head start. And then because, you know, these guys have been eating hot dogs and whatever in the crowd, you know, these folks, they're just bringing from the crowd, they lose this race all the time because this guy's an Olympic caliber athlete, and he just runs them down and wins the race. I saw one of these events, though, and, and some folks had figured this out, and Mr. Freeze has lost some races, and I, I saw a video recently of this guy who, who is way ahead of Mr. Freeze. He's given this huge head start, and he's a good enough athlete, he's a good enough sprinter, runner, whatever, that he's going to win this race. Three feet from the finish line, though, he hits the dirt, just wipes out, and Mr. Freeze kind of jogs by in victory. I imagine that's what it looks like for Peter and John. I don't know. Peter and John starts out first, and he's running, and, and maybe he trips and falls. Maybe he just is out of breath and exhausted and is older, and John's younger and, you know, better shape or whatever the deal is. In any event, John reaches the tomb first, and then he freezes. He gets to the tomb, and he stops. He's like, I'm not sure if this is a good idea. And I understand where John is coming from. A few weeks ago, uh, somebody was in one of our adult small groups on Sunday morning, and they, they came up to me after our last worship service, and they said, hey, I, we were in class, and we heard a noise in the ceiling. And I'm like, really? What, what, was, what do you think? They said, I think it was like a varmint. You know, it was some, something was running in the ceiling. And I said, really? Well, maybe it was a mouse, you know, that, that might be. They said, oh, no, it wasn't a mouse. It was too loud to be a mouse. And so I, I go and get one of my friends say, hey, let's go check this out. They said they heard something. I think maybe it was a mouse in the ceiling or whatever. And they said it was bigger. And so, you know, hopefully it's not like a raccoon chewed his way through the roof or what, whatever the deal is. So let's go check it out. And we go into the, the classroom. And it's a lot like when I, I go to look at a car, you know. Hey, I better pop this hood and see. Yep, there's an engine there. You know, so I go into the classroom, and, and we're standing there, and I'm like, do you hear anything? And he said, no. Do you hear anything? I said, no. And, and we're kind of looking at each other and thinking, problem solved. <laughs> you know, and he said, well, he, he, my friend said to me, look, I would, I, would, I would get a ladder and go up and look in the ceiling, but I don't have time right now. And I thought, yeah, 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 me too. I don't have time right now to do this. Otherwise, I'd just climb up there and let whatever attack me that's up there. You know, that's fine. So I understand John, he gets to the tomb and he freezes and he's like, I'm not sure I can go in. But Mr. Freeze Peter eventually catches up to him. 
And he gets to the tomb, and he goes right in. Verse 7, uh, uh, verse 6, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the faith cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Now, re- do you remember Mary's explanation for the empty tomb? Somebody came and stole the body. Somebody took the body. We, we're dealing with a grave robbery situation here. Somebody took this, this, this body out of here. I don't know, uh, you know, my youngest daughter Zoe is graduating from high school this year, so we've had, you know, the last several years, we've had some teenagers in our house, and I remember when I was a teenager, and, and sometimes when my mom would, would come home and she'd be like, Lance, you've got to go do something with that room because it's, a, it's scary, it's a disaster, you've got to go in there and figure that out. And, and so I remember this. I'm truly not pointing fingers, but the other day I went into Zoe's room and I looked around and I thought, Phew. you know, it's not a big room, but I called out. I said, Zoe, you know, because she could have been in there. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I was, I was concerned for her safety. Like I didn't know if she couldn't get out from under something. And I said, Zoe, are you there? And, and you know, you're, I thought maybe she was robbed. Because if somebody robs some, a place, you know, they, it, it's a disaster. It looks maybe like a teenager's room. You know, they're pulling things out and looking for the valuables. And I guess this is my deal. If somebody goes to rob a grave, I don't think they stop on their way out to fold the laundry. Right? And what's more, to separate part of the laundry from the other laundry and to make it look like the body had laid there. You know, something else had happened here. And so Peter goes right in and he sees the laundry all folded. Then the other disciple in verse 8, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. Believe is an important word, it's an important theme in the Gospel of John, and, and uh, often it's translated almost exclus- exclusively in the Gospel of John, this Greek word is translated as believe, but in other places it's sometimes translated as trust. You know, it's this idea that we can, we can trust in, in what, what God is saying is really true, and it, it's something more than just kind of an intellectual acknowledgement of what's going on. I think when John talks about believing in Jesus, he's really using that word in, in the ways that maybe other gospel writers talk about following Jesus, what it looks like to follow after Jesus. Because when we follow after Jesus, certainly that, that trust that Jesus is sent by God is a part of it. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So I trust that Jesus is sent by God. I trust that he he lived and he ministered and he went to the cross and he was buried in a tomb and he rose on that third day, that he's at the right hand promising to return. And so part of following Jesus is this this trust that God's big plan, it it really works, that it's going to happen, that it is happening. Uh, But it's followed quickly by a response to that trust. If we trust Jesus, then, then we, we do something in response. And In fact, when Peter preaches this message uh, in Jerusalem shortly after uh, Jesus' death and, and resurrection, he's preaching to thousands and thousands of people we know because thousands of people responded. They said, what do we do next? If we believe that Jesus is sent from God, what do we do next? And, and Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we repent, we change direction. We, we, we leave those selfish desires behind and we quit putting ourselves first and we start putting Jesus first and then others and we kind of bring up the rear on that. We repent, we change direction. And we say yes to Jesus in baptism. The New Testament teaches that when we want to begin a relationship with Jesus, when we want to acknowledge him as Lord and Savior, we do that through baptism and the Holy Spirit moves in and he begins to make us new from the inside out. And so we don't stop in relationship with him. We continue to grow and the Holy Spirit makes us new and we become more and more and more like Jesus. And then we're on mission for him. Our response doesn't end there either. Jesus, just before he ascended in 
and heaven left uh, his disciples with these last words. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have taught you. And so following Jesus means believing, trusting that he's sent from God, absolutely, but then responding by changing direction, accepting him in baptism, growing to become more like him, and then being on mission. Just like Mary, eventually, she goes and says, I've seen the Lord risen. We're on mission for him. It's this perfect faith that at the same time, it's just completely imperfect, isn't it? I mean, you don't, you don't get very far. In fact, just from verse 8, when John goes in and he believes, to verse 9, for as, they, as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. John had to continue to grow. And maybe you're in the place this morning where you're, you're trying to figure out this, this empty tomb thing. How do we make sense of this? Uh, this historian that I like to read, Gary Habermas, uh, he's a guy who grew up in the church and then he, he left the church for a while, had all these doubts, and he started to examine how can we really trust what, what the scripture says and what, what the Bible says. And he started to take a look at the historicity of Jesus. And, and he, he fa- came to a point after years and years of study and, and conversation with other scholars and all of that stuff, he came to a point where he had a list of 12 facts that almost every scholar, secular or believing, said we can trust about Jesus' life. And so he's got this list of, of 12 facts, and, and, uh, and then he boiled it down even further. If you want a list of these 12, all these 12 facts, I can get that to you, and, and, and we'll be sure. I want to take a look at just these four, though. Because uh, 1, 5, 6, and 12 on his list, uh, every, nearly every scholar, whether no matter how critical they are, of scripture. I, I agree, we can, we can trust these four things about the life of Jesus. And, and so these are folks who are atheists, who don't believe in God, who don't believe in the supernatural, who think this, you know, we, we can still trust these four things about the life of Jesus. The, one, Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Uh, that The disciples had experiences that they believed were the actual appearance of the risen Christ. That due to these experiences, the disciples' lives were thoroughly transformed. They were even willing to die for their belief. That just a few years later, Paul became a believer due to an experience that he also believed was an appearance of the risen Jesus. And so if you take these four things and you say, okay, well, even just these four things we can trust about the life of Jesus, you've got to figure out how do we explain this? How do we explain that these disciples, you know, Scripture says up to 500 people saw the risen Savior. They all had the same experience. How, how do you explain that? How do you explain that the lives of these guys, these followers of Jesus, who Peter and John, who Mary had to go find because she was hide, because they were hiding, they were scared of the authorities, they didn't know, they, they were in fear for their life, these folks are hiding away, not knowing what's next. How do you explain that that same group, that same Peter, who's running to the tomb after hiding, preaches this message in front of thousands and thousands of people on Pentecost in Jerusalem, the very city where Jesus was executed, buried, and rose from the dead. How does he get from point A to point B? How does this guy named Paul, whose real name was Saul, and then he meets Jesus and Jesus changes it to Paul, how do you explain that this guy Saul, who is on a road to Damascus in order to arrest believers and maybe even kill them, how do you explain that this guy, who is the number one persecutor of the way, the early church, how do you explain that he changes his name to Paul and moves from persecuting the church to being the church's first missionary? How do you explain those changes in these followers' lives? I would humbly submit that the best explanation for that empty tomb for the change in those believers' lives, for the fact that 500 people shared the same experience of seeing Jesus, is that that tomb was empty because Jesus rose from the dead. That sometimes the most unexpected, perhaps, explanation is still the very best explanation. 
we all have this one perfectly imperfect faith. Let's go quickly to the third part, part number three. Part number three is that there's one personal Lord that we all share. Uh, Look at verse 11 here. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Uh, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Mary is broken. She's so hurting. She's in so much grief and pain and suffering. I think we get a little insight into just how much she was hurting by her reaction both to Jesus, but even to these angels. Because when you read about people reacting to angels in the Gospels and other places, I mean, they react. They freak out. They are frightened for their lives. They fall down and try to worship them. They they are scared in their presence. And Mary doesn't blink. She sees these guys in white. The other gospel accounts say they were white clothes. They were sort of shining. It was obvious, in other words, that these guys were angels. And Mary is so brokenhearted that she's like, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Even when we get this Hollywood moment and Mary turns around in verse 14 and, and we, she, she still, she misses Jesus. I, I, probably for some other reasons as well, but, but at least partially because she's so hurting, she's so exhausted, she's so tired. She's in so much pain. And so what changes that moment? Well, it's verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, Jesus calls her by name, and she turns instantly and responds, Rabboni, she knows who he is. Here's her teacher. Here's Jesus, raised from the dead. This this God who acts in this huge way wants to know her in this personal way. Maybe you have different names that people call you. I mean, I have different names that sometimes people call me. One, George, one of our elders here, he always calls me Rusty. That's a long story. We're not going to get into it. You know, but I have, a, I have a wife, Sherry, sometimes calls me husband, right? I've got kids who call me dad and uh, all sorts of different ways. Sometimes dad, 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 you know, all kinds of different ways. I hear dad sometimes. Uh, you know, my mom calls me Pooh. That's another long story. We're not going to get into it. But when, I, when somebody calls on the phone, I, I know if I answer the phone and they say, Pastor Kaufman, I know I don't know this person, right? I'm ready for the sales pitch, whatever it is. If I answer that phone and they say, Pooh, well, I know it, it's, it, that's my mom. Uh, it, by the name, but certainly even by their voice, right? We recognize the important people in our lives and we recognize their voice and we know who it is. And that's Mary and Jesus, That's the kind of relationship they had. That's the kind of relationship that Jesus wants desperately to have with you, with every one of us. It's why why Jesus sends Mary on her way. It's not because Jesus was tired of the embrace. You know, it's not because Jesus, I like to think so, but it's not necessarily because Jesus just wanted a fist bump instead of a hug. It's because, hey, I want everyone to know about today. I want everybody to know that I'm alive. I want this relationship with every single one. And so Mary goes, and she's the first to proclaim, I've seen the Lord risen. And she tells Peter and John and the other disciples everything that Jesus had told her. You think about those selfies and those pictures. Now you, you can, you know, when you post them on, online or social media or whatever, you have filters you use sometimes and they make you look like a cat or something ridiculous or sparkly face or just younger or all sorts of things. And, and you can put this filter on to kind of clean up a picture. The reality is, though, if you're the world's worst selfie taker and you've cut half of your face off or you only got your nostrils in the picture, no matter what the filter is, no matter how good it is, it's not going to clean it up enough. It doesn't change what you're missing. It doesn't change the inside. And when we ask those really big questions in life, like, what's the meaning of life? And we chase after those answers, so much of the time we spend looking for sort of filters, 
something to kind of clean up the outside so we can look like we have it together. And we're still hurting and missing and, and empty on the inside. And the only answer to that emptiness inside is to know Jesus. I don't know where you are today, but, but maybe you need to, to decide, hey, I, I need to be a part of this plan more. I need to, I need to be in service, and, and i got to figure this out. Where can, I, where can I help? Where can I serve? How can I, how can I glorify my God through my actions and we want to help you to do that if you need a, a place to serve today I, I want you to just write the word plan on that welcome home card and I, I'm going to talk to you this week and help you to do that uh, some of you might have questions you you might be saying I need that list of 12 historical facts because I've got to make sense of this empty tomb and I've just got questions about what it means to follow Jesus I want to help answer those questions the best I can just write the word faith on that welcome home card and I'm going to talk to you this week and we're going to figure out where, where's the best place to look? Where are the best resources I can, I can get to answer some of those questions? And some of you might need to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. And, and if that's you, I don't want you to leave this morning without talking to somebody. Stop me in the hallway. Talk to somebody you've seen on stage. Ask the person who invited you, what do I need to do to say yes to Jesus? How can I receive him in, in baptism? And, and if you want, just write the word Lord on that welcome home card. And I'm going to talk to you about that this week. And, and we're going we're gonna to help you to find a time and, 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 and just to say yes to him in baptism. So if you need to serve, write plan. If you need to have questions answered about faith, write, write the word faith. And if you want to say yes to him, write the word uh, Lord on that welcome home card. Let's just stand right now and give him the worship that he deserves. <laughs>